be this author's reference to Judas Maccabeus. It may be that he knows that there is an armed resistance, and it's a little bit of help, but he doesn't believe himself that the answer to Antiochus IV is going to be an armed revolt. He believes that it's not going to ultimately succeed. Why? Because God's going to be the one who will intervene, not Judas Maccabeus. The king shall act as he pleases. He shall exalt himself, consider himself greater than any god. Remember Antiochus Epiphanes, God manifest, and shall speak horrendous things against the god of gods. He shall prosper until the period of wrath is completed, for what is determined shall be done. He shall pay no respect to the gods of his ancestors or to the one beloved by women. He shall pay no respect to any other god. He shall consider himself greater than all, blah, 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 blah. So it's all about setting himself up. Now look, he shall come into the beautiful land, obviously we're talking about Judea, and tens of thousands shall fall victim, but Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites shall escape from his power. He shall stretch forth his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. In other words, Antiochus IV this time is actually going to capture Egypt, he's predicting. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow in his train. Not only will he overrun Egypt, he's going to go west of Egypt and take Libya and south of Egypt and take Ethiopia. But reports from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to bring ruin and complete destruction to many. He shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea. What's the sea? What's the sea? Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Thank you. Somebody's awake. And the beautiful holy mountain. What's the holy mountain? Say it. Zion. Mount Zion, which is where Jerusalem is founded. Yet he shall come to his end with no one to help him. He shall come to his end. Wait a minute. He conquers Egypt, takes Libya, takes Ethiopia, comes back through Judea, sets up camp somewhere in that coastal area between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean, and there he dies. That didn't happen. Antiochus IV never took all of Egypt. He never took Ethiopia. He never took Libya. And he did eventually die, but he died way over in Babylon. He didn't die here. How do we know that this document was written around the year 164? Because this author doesn't know the end of the story. Notice how throughout the history, he's gotten everything right. Well, not every detail, but he gets a lot of it right. He knows when Antiochus the so-and-so wins a battle. He knows when one of the Ptolemies wins a battle. He knows when they tried to have a, a treaty between them and marry off one of their daughters to each other to, to establish peace. He knows when they've called truces. He knows when the Romans intervened and, and stopped uh, battles between them. He knows, he, knows all the, he knows that Antiochus profaned the temple. So he's, this has got to be written after 167 because he's telling us all about this stuff that happened with the temple. He knows everything that happens up to 167. And there may be a little hint that he even knows about Judas Maccabeus. But he doesn't know about anything that happened to the cleansing of the temple. He doesn't know about the victory of Judas, which happened in 164. Notice how this is wonderfully convenient for us modern scholars. He gets everything right up to 167 and everything wrong at 164. Because notice what happens then, tw chapter 12. Right as Antiochus IV dies, according to his prophecy, at that time Michael the great prince, the protector of your people, Michael's an angel, the greatest angel, shall arise. There'll be a time of anguish. There's never been a In other words, this is when all hell breaks loose. The heavens come down. Michael swoops in on, in the, on a chariot from the sky with angelic armies, and they are the ones who bring the final victory. God breaks into history and brings the final victory. Judas Maccabeus doesn't win, in, win the battle. So this, this is how we date apocalyptic literature. Daniel is one of the earliest cases of what we call apocalyptic literature. It gives, uh, apocalypticism gives you this vision of what's going to happen in the very near future, and it answers the problems of suffering. And the answer is not arm yourselves and fight the battle yourself, because the, the odds are overwhelmingly against you. You can't defeat all of Rome. You can't defeat all of Greece. You can't defeat Antiochus with Epiphanes by yourself. But God can. And so angelic armies will break into history and bring about the solution to the problem. And the, the apocalyptic writer sets himself up usually 
far in the distant past, like this guy says he's Daniel writing in the 6th century, and they narrate history through the, the ages. And you can tell, wow, he's got it all right. Daniel foresaw this stuff writing way back in, in the year, you know, 580. And yet he's, he knows about the Persians, he knows about the Medes, he knows about the Greeks, he knows about Alexander, he knows about the splitting of Babylon's kingdom, he knows about Berenice, he knows about the Romans. And, and so you think, he knows all this stuff, he got it all right, and you pick it up and you're reading it in the year 164 yourself, 165, and you think, well, he must be right about what's going to happen next. So you think, God's going to break in any day. We're going to be saved. We don't have to fight ourselves, we're going to be saved. And this is how we date apocalyptic literature where do they get the history right, and then when does the history go <laughs> When does the history just all of a sudden go wrong? That's when it's dated, because they're writing up to that point. So one of the way, that, will, that kind of apocalyptic mentality, that apocalyptic worldview, will become very important for early Christianity, because what I'll argue in the rest of this course is, who else was an apocalyptic prophet? Jesus. Who else was an apocalyptic prophet? Paul. All of the earliest followers of Jesus seem to have been apocalyptic-minded Jews. And that's the beginning of early Christianity. Early Christianity starts off as an apocalyptic Jewish sect. They all were reading Daniel. And they were, when they read other prophecies from the Hebrew Bible, they also read those apocalyptically. So the apocalyptic response is another one of these responses to Hellenization. In, not, in 63, about a hundred years after the cleansing of the temple, first, are there any questions about any of that so far? I'm giving you a lot of both in confusing history and confusing terminology. A hundred years after the cleansing of the temple, mas o menos, in the year 63 BCE, Pompey, the, general, the Roman general Pompey, enters Jerusalem, and this is when you have the beginning of Roman control of Judea. Herod the Great gets himself appointed as king of the Jews by the Romans, by the Roman Senate. Only the Senate at this time can proclaim anybody a king. So the Senate would sometimes have client kings on the different, the edge, the frontiers of their control. They couldn't they didn't want to be bothered with controlling everything themselves with their own armies directly or their governors, so they would appoint local kings, uh, whether in Asia Minor, Greece, different parts. Herod the Great was appointed king by the Roman Senate, and he ruled from the year 37 to the year 4 BCE. After Herod the Great died, his kingdom was split up first among his different sons, but Judea itself eventually was placed under direct Roman rule under procurators that were appointed by the Senate or sometimes by the Emperor. And this is what Pilate's job was. Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea, his actual title wasn't governor, that was, he was a procurator, but he was the one in control of Judea during the, life, during the time that Jesus was killed himself. Pilate was one of these direct Roman rulers of Judea. Galilee was ruled by a son of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, and different ancest, uh, descendants of Herod would rule in different parts of, the, of Palestine for many years after that. During the first century, there were sporadic uprisings among the Jews. Some of them were apocalyptic, that is, they seemed to have been uh, Jews who were expecting the end to come, but, but sometimes they seemed to have expected that they were supposed to start it. So, for example, you have Pro Josephus tell us about Jewish prophets who would arise and say, follow me to Jerusalem, follow me to Jerusalem, and they'd stand on the Mount of Olives, which is this mountain that's right opposite the main mountain of Jerusalem, and they'd say, okay, tomorrow we're going to go out and we're going to march around the walls of Jerusalem, and the walls are all going to fall down. Sound like anything you're familiar with? The walls of Jericho in the Hebrew Bible falling down after the Israelites marched around it for seven days and then seven times the last day. Prophets were arising using inspiration from Jewish prophets from the ancient past, and they were setting themselves up again as prophets, and again expecting God to break through. So sometimes these prophets arose, and they were themselves apocalyptic prophets, announcing the end of, of uh, the known world soon. Sometimes also they seem to have been setting themselves up as king of the Jews, and that would make them a Messiah. 
because the word Messiah in Hebrew just means the anointed one. And what do you do when you make someone a king in the ancient world? You put oil on, on their heads. That's how you, you anoint a king. So if someone's called the anointed one, that's a kingly title. Now this is very dangerous because what did I just say about how did you get to be a king in Roman controlled area? The Senate had to appoint you. Anybody who set himself up as king without being appointed king by the Senate, that was itself an